Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! So, four weeks to go until polling day on June the 8th. What will the party strategies be for the remaining four weeks of it? Let's start with the Conservatives. Uh, do they just try to continue to play safe for four weeks? Yes, with this uh, important qualification. Theresa May called this election to get her own personal mandate, mm. partly partly because she thought she would win it big, but to get her own personal mandate. And therefore, she does need to define it uh, in her own interests mm. as well as uh, in, to do with accountability to the country. So uh, clearly, um, they're not going to take any risks when they're so far ahead in the polls. But what they say in the manifesto matters in terms of the space she has mm. in the coming years to define her leadership as against David Cameron's. Um, she's a free figure, partly on the basis of what she says, as well as how big she wins. So they can't just play it safe and, and repeat the mantra of st strong and stable leadership, stable and strong leadership, fix strong, stable leadership, <laughs> fix it every way you want. They will have to talk policy. If she's going to claim her own man uh, mandate, they do have to talk policy. I think that's right. And I think what's unusual about this is that the manifesto matters far more because of what they have to do with it afterwards mm. than in terms of whether it's going to win anybody over now. And clearly the strategy is, yes, we have to lay out a few things. There's still some quite interesting debates as to whether, for example, they will commit still to this ambition of reducing immigration to the tens of thousands. Yes. We don't know what the answer is going to be on that yet. And it's a question of whether she is setting herself up for difficulties later on. Okay, Shannon? <coughs> well, It'll be a short manifesto, I would venture to guess. Uh, it's in her interests to, to be as um, non-committal as possible, and therefore that argues for a short manifesto. But what strikes me about the Conservative campaign, aside from the, amb the, uh, the sort of ambiguity on policy, is how personal it is. I think Theresa May, in her most recent speech, referred to my local candidates rather than to uh, Parliament, parliamentary candidates or council candidates, very much framing it in, as a presidential very candidate would do in yeah. France or in the US. And I think yeah. that's not uh, irrational on her part. Everything I hear from the, from the MPs on the ground and from the focus groups being done by the parties is that a big chunk of the population now personally identify with her. That yes. if you could wrap up Middle England into a, into a physical object and, and, and embody it in a person, <laughs> it would be Theresa May. In and so, although Jeremy Corbyn's unpopularity accounts for a big slice of her popularity, she herself has done a good job at bonding with the, the public. Well, we never saw that coming. Yeah. Uh, but you may well be right that it's happening. Now, Labour has said it wants John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor, to play a more prominent role in the Labour campaign. And he was on the Andrew Marr show uh, this morning. He was asked if he was a Marxist, and he denied uh, that he was. That slightly surprised me, because I had seen tape from before saying not only that he was, but he was rather uh, proud of it. So let's just have a look at now and then. Are you a Marxist? All right. I believe there's a lot to learn. No, no or well, yes, I okay. couldn't work it no, out. Well, I tell you, I believe there's a lot to learn from reading Capital. Yes, of course it is, because that and that's been recommended not just by me but many others, mainstream economists as well. But I also believe in the long tradition of the Labour Party. We've got to demand systemic change. I'm, look, I'm straight. I'm honest with you. I'm a Marxist. You know, I've been, this is a classic mark crisis of the economy, classic capitalist crisis. I've been waiting for this for a generation. <laughs> That second clip we think was about four years ago. Uh, no, I'm not a Marxist. Yes, I am a Marxist. I've been waiting for the Marxist revolution his whole life. Does this sort of thing matter? Yes, although I, in fairness to McDonald, I think he's a really good interviewee um, of the, the shadow cabinet of untested figures in a national campaign. None of them have ever been exposed up, on any level to a sort of national media campaign they're all about to experience. He, I think, is the best interviewee. In terms of this, in fairness to him, um, when he gave that clip four years ago, I bet he never dreamt that he would be in this senior front bench position. But their background is clear. They are of the left that um, I think they would have all described. Jeremy Corbyn probably would have done, although I think he's close to being a sort of Tony Benn Benite. And so that's 
there are about four Labour campaigns being fought in this election. There's their campaign, there's the old shadow cabinet who are out campaigning in constituencies but not identifying with that campaign. There's the okay. former Labour leader, Tony okay. Blair, and it's... it's, 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 it's a, is it damaging or not? Oh, I think it is damaging. If they could be damaged any further, you could, I can just see all the Labour MPs with their heads in their hands. I mean, what I'm hearing from Labour MPs is that there is not one of them that doesn't feel they have a horrendous battle on their hands. And these are going to be very individual local campaigns where lo local MPs are winning despite the party leadership, not because of it. And already talk is turning to what happens next. And is there any way that Jeremy Corbyn, given a horrendous set of general election results as many of them anticipate might defy all political behavioral norms and stay on all the same because it's not clear that even if the polls are right and labor loses badly that mr corbyn will go john mcdonald this morning kind of implied that that may not be the case at all though previously he had said it, it would be what do you make of these reports that the labor strategy is is not I can't believe I'm quite saying this, not to win seats, but to maximise their share of the vote. If they do better than Ed Miliband, he got 30.5% of the vote, then they believe they live to fight another day. Yeah, it reminded me of Tony Benn's speech after the 83 election, I think, when he said that as bad as the parliamentary defeat was, there were 8 million votes for, so for socialism. There was a big uh, section of public opinion which voted for that manifesto. And I wonder whether that is actually the Corbynites' best chance of hanging on to power uh, within Labour in June, if they can point to X million votes rather than a diminished number of parliamentary seats and say that's a platform on which we can build. I mean, that said, even moderate Labour MPs aren't desperate for a really quick leadership contest. Mm. I'm hearing a lot of them saying that they would actually like to leave it for a year, perhaps have Tom Watson as an acting Labour leader. He would still have a mandate. Give the ch party a chance to regroup, get rid of some of its problems, decide where it stands on policy, and most importantly, for potential candidates to show what they're made of, while, rather than lurching straight into what would likely be an Yvette Cooper coronation. Just give me, Steve, 30 seconds on the Lib Dems, because their strategy clearly was to kind of mop up the Remain vote. Labour a bit uncertain, Tories clearly the Brexit party now, UKIP and demise. It's not quite worked out quite as smoothly so, so far. The Remainers have got a real dilemma. The Lib Dems aren't a strong enough vessel with their eight or nine MPs for them to sort of risk all on uh, going for them. Labour aren't entirely clear where they stand on Brexit. Um, so there isn't a robust alternative vessel for what is now a pro-Brexit Conservative Party at the moment. All right. Four weeks to go, as I say, but not for France. It's been voting since early this morning, and we should get the first estimate of who will be the country's next president at around 7 o'clock UK time tonight. Just to warn you, there are some flashing images coming up. The choice in France is between a centre-left liberal reformer, Emmanuel Macron, and a right-wing nationalist, Marine Le Pen. Both have been casting their votes this morning. The two candidates topped a field of 11 presidential hopefuls in the first round of elections two weeks ago. The campaign has been marked by its unpredictability and surprises. And in a final twist on Friday evening, just before campaigning officially ended, Monsieur Macron's En Marche group said it had been the victim of a, quote, massive hack with a trove of documents released online. The Macron team said real documents were mixed up with fake ones. And the electoral authorities, who are very powerful in France, warned the media and the public that spreading details of the le leaks would breach strict election rules. I'm joined now from Paris by the journalist Anne Elizabeth uh, Moutet. Uh, Anne Elizabeth, as I left Paris very, very recently, the po everybody told me that uh, it, the consensus was Mr. Macron was going to win and going to win pretty comfortably. Is there any reason to doubt that? I don't think there's any reason to doubt that. There have been so many people left and right, former candidates, uh, who uh, decided that uh, it was more important to vote for Macron, even if they disagreed with him, than to uh, run the risk of having Marine Le Pen become president. 
that I think the spread is now 20 points, 60% to Macron, roughly 40% to Macron. That is so well outside the margin of error that it would take something huge uh, for this to be upset. So if the consensus in the polls are right, Mr. Macron wins. He has to put together a government in May. There's a kind of coronation almost, I think, on May the 14th. Uh, but he then faces parliamentary elections in June. And he could face a balkanized, a fractious parliament, a parliament in which he doesn't have a clear majority for his reforms. He could then face some difficulties getting his program through. I think right now the way things are looking and considering that you've got one half of the Républicain Party, the Conservative Party, the Juppé half, which is now making very clear signs, uh, uh, not only to that they want to support Macron, but they are actively supporting him, uh, that probably he's looking at the equivalent of the German GroKo, the Great Coalition. And among that coalition, depending on how many seats uh, uh, established parties keep in the House, uh, he might very well have a Republican Prime Minister, but instead of having, having an adversarial Republican Prime Minister, he would not have Monsieur Juppé. Monsieur Juppé is now in his 70s, that's too late. But he might very well have someone like Nathalie kosciusko morizet who's uh, relatively unknown outside France, young, uh, a woman, uh, um, the contested but lost the, the Paris uh, mayorship three years ago, uh, is a scientist and in general has been a Secretary of State and a minister in the Sarkozy government. Okay. Uh, and she would be an interesting coalition prime minister. And, just, and finally, just briefly, uh, Anne Elizabeth, uh, Marine Le Pen, if she goes down to defeat uh, tonight, does she have the stomach, does she have the ambition, does she have the energy to try it all again in 2022? She has all of that. The question is, will they let her and how bad will she lose? Because then her niece, who's now 27, who is a hard-working, heart-studying person, unlike Marine, who flubbed her debate entirely, Marion Maréchal Le Pen, very popular with the right side of the front, there is such a thing. Now, she might decide that 2022 is her turn, yet another Le Pen. All right, well, we shall see. Only five years to wait, but only a few hours to wait uh, for the result in the French presidential election tonight. Uh, Anne-Elizabeth Moutet, thank you.